Hey, this is Dave. Before we get into this uh, video today, I want to uh, say thanks to those of you who have subscribed to this channel. We uh, are working our way slowly toward 100 subscribers, and when we get there, uh, apparently YouTube will allow us to have a, uh, a channel name as opposed to a long series of, uh, of uh, unrelated characters. So uh, thank you. Uh, if you have subscribed, if you haven't, please consider doing it. It's absolutely free. All you got to do is look down there and somewhere down below on this screen, there's a button that's marked subscribe. So today uh, I'm going to be uh, doing a video that I shot back in June at the public library in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was there for the Nation of Makers uh, conference and had a chance to visit the public library and their fascinating uh, makerspace, one of the most successful that I've seen in libraries. Now I've, I've visited makerspaces and libraries in uh, several parts of the world, both here in the uh, States, uh, also in uh, Europe, especially in the Scandinavian countries, and uh, I'm really uh, I'm really uh, interested in the interface between uh, between libraries and maker spaces. It seems to be a good one. Most libraries, uh, you know, I talked to a librarian recently uh, about why, um, you know, about would it be possible to put a bring a maker space into into her library, and she said, "Well, we don't have the the money, we don't have the funds, we don't have the staff. You know, what would we?" what we stop doing in order to have the have a maker space. So so I get that, but. Uh, uh, there are some brave uh, library systems that do have maker spaces, and among them in the beautiful, progressive, and uh, well-connected city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, a um, uh, organization called GigaLab that's part of the Chattanooga Public Library. Uh, the public library is freaking beautiful, and uh, on the fourth floor of the library in what used to be uh, a storage room, They've redone that, and it's a gorgeous maker space now that has tons of interesting equipment in it, and uh, librarians are ready to help you uh, figure out how to use the machines and help you learn how to complete your projects. Uh, really awesome place. So I had been following this space since all an opening, just applied, and I think it was almost two years after the space had begun. So it started off. Kind of like when we get over to the electrics bench, which I'm sure all of you all know what chaos that'll look like. It was kind of like a, a hacker space is what it started out. It was electronics, 3D printing, um, programming, all of the like STEM and STEAM stuff that we've seen. That's what it, the core of it was. And for the first two years, it was like a boys club. It was the same 10 people in and out um, working on their projects. And it wasn't until we started getting into more general interests like arts and crafts and kind of like home ec and shop type stuff that people used to be exposed to in school, that's brought in a lot more people. More people will use the heat press in the next week than have ever turned on a soldering iron here. You know, more people will do screen printing as a job than they'll ever do a job that interacts with an Arduino. I assume since we work at makerspaces are involved, a lot of y'all have seen um, these setups before. So I'll skip explaining the actual 3D printing and more explain why we're still using a MakerBot. As, but the reason that we've stuck with it is because it's still the only 3D printer I've used where I can get from Thingiverse to printing within like three clicks. And so for better or worse, regardless of if the hardware is good or not, uh, that's so much easier to teach our patrons and so much more consistent. We have two amazing mold pots. Um, they can take any type of plastic that's made for the three millimeter, which became our biggest problem with them because people would seemingly, and up here we kind of give people space after we've worked with them. Uh, we're not going to do something for somebody, so we're teaching them how to be able to do it for themselves. So if I see someone over there and it looks like they have it all together, you know, I'll give them space to explore that and play with the machine, and that's utterly backfired. Uh, they knew enough to be able to change the plastic, but not enough to realize that if they change to a different type of plastic, they might need to change the temperature. So those would just constantly jam. I think I've spent like five hours at this point. I replaced the whole extruder, and it's still jamming, so that's a deeper electronics issue. So we're gonna lock that down a little bit when we get them back, and just keep it to one plastic type. For the manual control, the full spectrum, but the Glowforge, just like the MakerBot, is so much easier to use. Uh, so that can uh, cater to what people can actually use versus what I might prefer to teach. 
Uh, so with the Glowforge, that's all going through their own special app, but most of the time we're still using Illustrator to prepare everything, especially considering a lot of people start on the vinyl, so they've already got a little bit of experience working with Illustrator. We've taught them how to take their artwork and convert it into the lines, or if you're just engraving um, for the pixel-based information, you don't even have to convert anything. You could just upload the JPEG to Glowforge's app and get it going. And we've got some different examples. This is like the button station. No matter how many times we organize it, it'll always look like this. So this is uh, what I show people first is something like this, because if they've come from the vinyl, they understand if there's a vector line, it follows it along. That's a razor blade. This is a laser. Same artwork, though. And uh, what it's even more impressive at is doing engravings. This is my friend's wedding photo. And this is back before I realized that making a full plank engraving is just way too large to send to somebody. That's overkill. Uh, so now we can practice in doing smaller ones. And this is a good time for me to point out the time expectation management of it takes an hour and a half to do one pass on here. And so Michael went on to tell me uh, and the visitors to the uh, to the space that day uh, more about some of the other machines they have. They have, in addition to uh, the um, the machines we saw, the laser cutter, the um, uh, the 3D printers, which of course you know it's kind of ubiquitous in maker spaces. Uh, they said their he said their most uh, used piece of equipment was their vinyl cutter, and a lot of folks that came in uh, to the to the space uh, would come in with uh, an idea in mind of creating a logo for say a, an urban streetwear brand or a, a band um, or a, uh, a high fashion line or something like that and would uh, originally uh, start out learning enough about vector graphics to to cut a uh, to cut the uh, the vinyl and then uh, go ahead and uh, and move on to the laser cutter perhaps and perhaps cut a stencil or cut a uh, cut a plaque or something like that and then move into their fully equipped photo studio which is really nice too now uh, they also have a sound uh, studio in the space it's I think it's a little separate from the maker space different uh, different staff are in charge of it but they have a full recording studio that you can basically if you have a library card you can go in and use and and record your tracks and so on it's a very progressive city uh, Chattanooga has a municipal uh, broadband. They have gigabit fiber to every home and business in the city. But anyway, very proud of the folks uh, in Chattanooga for having the uh, for having the uh, the bravery, the foresight, and the uh, municipal will to political will to to fund a really, really, really beautiful maker space. It's so nice, and and I, I got to tell you that when you come to a space that has a uh, that has a staff member, a paid staff member, who's there all the time. And volunteers, hey, volunteers are great. We love volunteers. But uh, having a paid staff member who's there you know, on a regular basis makes all the difference in the world for a makerspace. Well, that's it for this, uh, this visit. Trying to keep these things a little shorter, <laughs> thanks to some of the feedback I received. And uh, thank you for the feedback I received both here uh, on YouTube and also uh, on Facebook and Instagram and other places that I post about makerspaces. So, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and uh, please, please, uh, if you haven't done so, if you would just take one second, one micro second and subscribe. I also want to thank the uh, board and the members and the volunteers who uh, put on this year's NomCon 2019, the annual conference of the Nation of Makers, the uh, I guess you'd call it the Trade Association for Maker Spaces in the United States and an amazing organization. Uh, my visit to the the, uh, the studio at the Chattanooga Public Library was organized as part of uh, NomCon 2019. So thank you folks for everything you do.